Good afternoon and welcome to the Alliance for Health Policies Summit on Health and the Economy. This past year has dramatically exposed the links between our health and our economic security at the personal, local, national, and global level. To protect the population's health and slow the spread of COVID-19, leaders in the United States and all over the world had to make difficult decisions quickly and under enormous pressure, leading to unprecedented changes in the way we live, work, play, and even pray. The pandemic laid bare the inequities between people who could readily work from home and those who had to choose between protecting their health and providing an income, between those with ready access to health care and those without, and between well-resourced and disadvantaged communities. Businesses had to hustle to find new ways to serve their customers and stay afloat. Millions lost jobs and with it, the security of health insurance coverage. And with schools closed, women disproportionately left the workforce to care for children. Now, as vaccines find their way into arms, businesses reopen and people return to a semblance of new normality, we at the Alliance thought this was the right time to assess how health and the economy are intertwined and where we go from here. We'll examine the impacts of COVID-19 on small businesses and the communities that they support. We'll discuss how consequential decisions were made about which workers were deemed essential and how parts of our economy retooled to meet the demands of the pandemic. Our speakers will examine how state and federal policymakers can reinforce local economies to improve health and what businesses are doing on their own to protect the health of their workforce. We'll begin with a discussion looking forward, how the intersection of personal finance, healthcare markets, and government budgets impact American healthcare choices and employment opportunities. I invite you to be an engaged participant in the discussion with our panelists and to challenge your thinking on the ways that health and the economy come together. You can join today's conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AHPSummit21 and follow us at All Health Policy. And now I am pleased to introduce an outstanding leader and nationally recognized health economist for today's keynote discussion to kick off our Health and the Economy Summit. Dr. Katherine Baker is the Dean Emmett Denman Professor at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Dean Baker is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Social Insurance, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Previously, Dean Baker served as commissioner on the MedPAC, Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or MedPAC, as chair of the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission, as chair of the board of directors of Academy Health, and as a Senate confirmed member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. We are so grateful to have Dean Baker here with us today to share her insights and to kick off our 2021 summit on health and the economy. Dean Baker, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's an honor uh, and we're so lucky to have you here with us. So, so I wanna, I wanna um, kick us off. We have about 25 minutes for um, a really great conversation. And so, you know, just to start with kind of the elephant in the room, I mean, from the beginning of the pandemic, it seemed that our health, our personal health, our family's health, you know, and the health of the economy were sort of pitted against each other in um, what was sort of a rigid way and um, obviously a very political way. But from a policy perspective, you know, I would contend and, it, you know, that there is more nuance to the story than that. So um, hoping that there we can. Is. And there always is. <laughs> there always is. Uh, and we did title this health and the economy, not health or the economy. So, um, you know, from, from, from that standpoint um, and, and from your perspective, you know, I want to ask you if, you know, if you think COVID-19 really changed anything fundamental about how we should view health policy goals and priorities in the context of our, you know, broader priorities like our national, you know, economic uh, wealth and security. Um, you know, are there some top lessons learned for us that, that, you, that you've been thinking about over the past year? Absolutely. I think the crisis raised some new issues that I think we were not prepared to deal with and hopefully we'll be better prepared next time. But it also elevated a lot of existing issues in the economy, in the way we deliver healthcare, and how those are intertwined and perhaps elevated in people's minds the importance of making sure that your access to healthcare was not so inextricably intertwined with your employment status if you're getting uh, insurance through your employer, for example example, and that the disparities of access to health care aren't exacerbating disparities in access to financial resources, in ability to work safely, and how those interact to generate wildly disparate health outcomes. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think, 
you know, people have talked, you know, obviously a lot for the last year about how just the, the disparities have really been laid bare. And I think what strikes me is how so much of our healthcare system, um, which included our public health infrastructure, was sort of, uh, you know, built on this chassis of like income uh, in inequality. And of, of course that ties uh, very much to racial inequality in our country, um, you know, but, but talk about, you know, how, how do you view that, um, you know, that, that challenge? Because, um, you know, I think our, our healthcare system is, is sort of um, in some ways, um, it just overlaid on, um, you know, what are some existing inequalities? And, and I think, um, you know, there were, there were, you know, even when you look at things like the provider relief fund um, and how formulas were allocated um, and, and, you know, things like that, just, you know, the, the more you dig into it, the more you see what, what those, those challenges were, you know, what, what can our health policy and health care system do, um, you know, to, smooth some of that out and, and and really get to a place where where people can um you know where we can get closer to that the health equity and um you know reduce some of those disparities well what the pandemic laid bare among many other things was the wide disparity in existing health burden and access to health care that we know that once you walk through the doors of a hospital or a doctor's office a lot has already happened to influence your health outcomes. The social determinants of health are also wildly disparate in different populations. And so thinking about baseline rates of non-communicable diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, things that come from nutrition, from access to green spaces, safe drinking water, um, stress has enormous negative consequences on health outcomes for adults and starts in childhood. So thinking about those social determinants has to be a vital part of thinking about narrowing disparities in health outcomes. But one of the challenges of thinking about responding to the pandemic in health policy is that while of course that has to be our primary priority right now, most healthcare looks very different from the healthcare needed to address a pandemic. And the pandemic is not like a lot of the health conditions that people face in more normal times that I hope we'll be returning to soon. When you think about um, what health insurance looks like, for example, the primary beneficiary of getting increased access to healthcare is the person getting that health care. The uninsured consume too little health care across a wide range of settings, from doctor's offices to prescription drugs to hospitalizations to address underlying conditions. If we expand access to that kind of health care, the people who were formerly uninsured or who were consuming too little of it are going to have much better health outcomes. That affects them fundamentally and their families but it doesn't have much of an effect on everybody else. Unlike communicable disease, where if you don't get vaccinated, if you have COVID, that very much affects you, your family, your community, me, you know, we're all interconnected directly for infectious disease. I think people like to make the case that insuring the uninsured would somehow benefit everyone. And it does in terms of social priorities, in terms of our goals for public policy and making sure that all residents have access to adequate health care and food and housing. But the direct spillover effects, for example, through the economy, which is where we started this conversation, I think are really second order compared to those primary effects that the individual feels. So if you get healthier, that's great for you. And that's important to me because I care about your health. It's not going to affect my tax rate very much. It's not going to affect the economy in a way that benefits me. And so you don't want to build a health insurance system around an infectious disease model that just doesn't apply to most non-communicable disease and health conditions. So, yeah, so do we, ha is there something we should be doing or thinking about or building now, you know, in terms of, you know, we talked about this difference between communicable, non-communicable diseases, and, and certainly, um, you know, this, this pandemic did shed some light on sort of people's personal decisions and how that, how that affected others, right? I'm, I'm not an economist and I don't play one on TV, but there's, I, there's an economics word for that, right? Isn't that externalities? <laughs> it's nicely done. Thank you. 
Um, I'm apl I'll, I'll apply to University of Chicago uh, tomorrow. So that's great. So so but but from it, from a the perspective of you know things like a pandemic that just affect everybody all at once or affect many people all at once. I mean, it, you know, we talk so much about you know the role of government versus the role of the private sector in terms of um, risk protection, in terms of you know what 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 kind of benefits should be. I mean. Is there a model we should be thinking about kind of going forward for, you know, kind of for lack of a better term, kind of disaster preparedness of, of something of this scale? Yeah, there are some things that the private market is really good at providing. And there's some things where the private market is just not the way to get it done. So I, I think having private competition to drive up quality, to drive down prices, to cater to different preferences that people have and different needs people have. I think that the private sector is much better at that kind of innovation. You know, I don't I don't think that the government by itself would have given us the vaccines that we have now. I think that kind of private sector innovation is vital for driving new invention and competition to benefit all of us who consume that healthcare. But the private market cannot do redistribution. The private market can help hedge individual risk, and we should all have insurance for all sorts of things, not just healthcare. But social insurance, redistributing from higher income to lower income, or from fundamentally healthy to persistently less healthy, the, go the government needs to be involved in that because the private sector cannot do that kind of redistribution. There's also the case of a broad sectoral shock something that hits everybody at the same time, where again, an insurer that has a small pool just cannot weather. And of course, they're, they're big reinsurance companies that try to offload the risk that even a big individual insurance company can't bear. But when there is something like a pandemic that affects the whole world at the same time, it's very hard for the private market to pool that risk. It's kind of similar to when there's a, a new treatment invented for something that lots and lots and lots of people would need at the same time. That kind of correlated risk where all of a sudden everyone needs something, there's a strong government role to smooth that risk over the broadest number of people possible and over time where a private insurer can't say, you know what, something big just happened this year, whether it's a natural disaster or a pandemic or climate change, something that is dramatically affecting the whole world or a big swath of the world at the same time, government policy can help address that over a long period of time in a way that no private actor can. So I think this highlighted when we need more centralized government action to respond to a really widely felt risk. Yeah, that's helpful. And we saw that in so many ways, right? Whether it was the, um, the you know, COVID relief packages that provided uh, you know, kind of literally just financial assistance to families or, um, you know, uh, some of the intersection that, that um, we saw in Operation Warp Speed where public and private sector really worked together. Um, and then down to the private sector innovation, of, you know, so many examples are coming up for me, like, um, you know, a year and a half ago, nobody wore masks really. And now all of a sudden you can buy them at the Gap and at you know, kind of anywhere, um, and you have all these different choices, and um, that was that was pretty amazing. Um, so, so a lot of examples there. You know, one thing, one thing in terms of the, the the sort of the role of the government is, you know, there's kind of a debate going on now about like when do you say when, as far as you know, extending unemployment benefits or, um, you know, kind of cash assistance. Like, can you can you say more about you know your your thoughts on that? Like. You know when when do you say when in terms of the, you know there's a bolus of help and now you know like are we coming out of this do we, how do you know who still needs the help you know how do we kind of address that well that's a fundamental challenge to all sorts of insurance whether it is unemployment insurance or health insurance you know the, the homeowners insurance there's always a trade-off between protection against risk which is the whole point of insurance and incentives that individuals face to help improve their situation on their own. And the balance between those changes based on what the external opportunities look like and also can be um, mitigated 
by more sophisticated design of the insurance. So let's start with health insurance. If you think about um, getting financial protection against the cost of a doctor's office visit, for example, if I have zero out-of-pocket cost for that, I'm gonna go to the doctor whenever I think it might help my health at all, even if it only helps my health by this much. If I have a $100 co-payment, I'm gonna think, is it gonna improve my health by $100 or more? Now I'm simplifying, I know the world is much more complicated than this, but I just wanna illustrate the trade-off. So if I have the zero copay, I have wonderful insurance protection. I don't face any risk financially for having to go to the doctor. If I have the $100 copayment, I face more risk. $100 to a lot of people would prohibit them from being able to get to the doctor's office. So it could be a real barrier, but you're gonna have less of that low value visit to the doctor's office where maybe you could just wait a couple days and see if it resolves on its own first. What's the right copayment to balance those? Well, I think a more sophisticated insurance design would take into account the value of the healthcare. So something that is a very high value, you don't need a copayment. You shouldn't have a copayment. If you've got a broken leg, you're not gonna say, I'm gonna go to the doctor eight times because I have insurance. You're gonna go once and you need to get the leg set. So there should be very little copayment there. For something like a medication that has a really questionable health benefit, where you think, you know what, it's not clear this is going to improve the person's health at all and it's very expensive. Maybe there should be a high copayment. And what high means varies based on people's income. So I would want to have higher copayments for higher income people, but I would also want to have lower copayments for high value health services that would help then make sure people had financial protection for healthcare that was of enormous benefit to them, but that we didn't have excess use of care that was of questionable health benefit. Now, that principle is difficult to apply in different situations. So you raise the question of unemployment insurance. And I think in a world where there are no jobs to be had, there's very little risk that people are going to suddenly have lower employment levels because you're helping them pay their rent. Whereas if you think there's a group of people where there is a set of jobs available to them and you wanna have time delimited benefits to make sure that people actually find the right match in good order, I think you'd want to nuance the benefits based on the jobs available, and you'd also want to give people enough runway to make sure that they find a good job match. Because sometimes it's, you know, in the modern labor market, it is not clear that your best job is with your best, your current training in your current location. So I think there's there's a balancing act there, but being cognizant of the difficulties in getting reemployed is probably really important in thinking about lengthening unemployment insurance benefits or raising the dollar amount. Yeah, yeah and our, 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 our systems, systems are, are so are so, are so clunky, clunky, right? right? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of the data, right? I mean, both from health insurance and, and unemployment insurance perspective. So it's it's a it's a huge implementation challenge. Um, so, I, I mean, I want to ask you, what do you see kind of going forward? It, you, you alluded to the innovation, um, you know, the, the enormous private sector innovation, right? Um, and, uh, you know, and unprecedented, um, you know, kind of um, public sector um, changes as well. You know, from going forward, what, what, if anything, do you think is, is going to change? I, I mean, um, you know, we, we've already, most of us have now discovered we can work from home, or I, well, I shouldn't say most of us, many people, and people with like kind of the privilege to do so, um, have discovered they can work from home. Um, you know, the, the gig economy um, has certainly um, accelerated in this time. Um, you know, it, it fundamentally, I mean, do you see any, any big shift? Um, going forward, and how is that then going to affect the way that we think about health and healthcare delivery? Well, I do think we can take away some small silver linings from the pandemic in terms of our use of technology to help solve problems. You know, we're going to have much more use of telemedicine. We're probably going to have more flexible workplaces where people, you know, I it seems like it's going to be a long time before people in huge swaths of the economy are expected to be in the office five days a week for full days, you know, there's going to be a uh, flexibility in places where we didn't see it before. I also think in terms of both healthcare and employment, we're, we're scratching the surface of what the data revolution is going to allow us to do. 
we have a lot more information available to us that we're still using to fiddle around the edges of things. When you think about machine learning and health data, we can do a better job at reading x-rays. We can think about which medicines are most effective for which people. Those are really important, but they're not the fundamental phase shift that I think that the technology may enable in the future in terms of thinking about much more sophisticated insurance design that would also enable us more effectively, going back to where we started, to decouple insurance from employment. One of the main advantages to having health insurance through employers is that you get bigger risk pools that aren't selected as much based on health, which means you don't have to worry as much about adverse selection to use a little more economics jargon. Um, and so even though the current tax subsidy for employer-based insurance is both inefficient and inequitable. That trade-off I talked about in insurance design, mm -hmm. the employer-sponsored insurance design we have now fails on both of those. So there's huge opportunity to improve equity as well as efficiency. But we have to think really hard about what that would do to the existing risk pools that we have that, again, are the whole point of insurance. But with better data where we could do better risk adjustment and make it easier for people to port their insurance plans across employers, across state lines, you know, this would allow a lot more flexibility that would uh, reduce the way that health insurance gums up labor markets right now without undermining the risk pooling that's fundamental to having good and functioning health insurance for people. So I think there's a lot of upside potential, but we don't yet have the legal or regulatory environment to take advantage of that. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think there's some people who would probably cheer at the thought of, you know, kind of being freed from uh, freeing health insurance from employment. And then there's others who get extremely short of breath at that um, notion and, and very, very nervous about it. And so there's a lot to um, a lot to consider there uh, as far as how we go forward. Well, let me let me ask you one one last question. You know, you, you um, you are um, a, a researcher, you're dean of a, of a public policy school. Um, you know, there we talk about lessons learned, um, and we've we've only barely been able to, um, you know, scratch the surface um, in in twenty minutes here. Um, but 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 when you think about like the economics research agenda going forward, when you think about how we use evidence, to, you know, what are some of the things you're looking for? What are some of the things that you're hoping um, that that can be you know, questions that you, you're hoping that we can answer um, through economics research um, going forward that'll, um, that'll help us to move the ball forward on both health and wealth. Well, there, there is so much um, new data available and so much more sophisticated analysis possible to understand cause and effect of different policies. And that's one of the things that's really challenging is for the production of health for the connection between health and social determinants and wealth and access to healthcare, these things all move at the same time. They're correlated in different populations. If you look at populations that have, you know, diminished access to healthcare, there are also people who have less safe environments. There are also people who have limited accumulated wealth and limited economic opportunities and limited educational opportunities. Of course, there's lots of variation in each of these, but they are lined up for populations that are under-resourced right now. And that's you know, a public policy tragedy that needs to be rectified, but it makes it also hard to figure out which policies really work and which ones don't, because so many of the things are intertwined. So there's, a, I think, a lot of opportunity for academic researchers like those at the Harris School and around the country to partner with stakeholders in government, in social ventures, in not-for-profits, to figure out how to evaluate their policies at the same time that they are implementing them at scale. And that's something that I think that we can tri contribute as a profession to better test in real time and in partnership with those who are on the ground implementing what actually works. Because there are a lot of things that sound like good ideas that don't actually pan out. And with the best of intentions, people can pour energy and money into programs that are not improving people's lives if we are not really hard-nosed about assessing what works and ending programs that are not getting the job done. 
some really wonderful advice for uh, current and aspiring health economists and for those of us in public policy. Thank you so much, uh, Dean and Dr. Catherine Baker for joining us today uh, for this summit on health and the economy. There is much, much more work to do and more conversation to be had. Uh, it's been a real honor to, um, to speak with you today. So glad to have the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And to those of you just chiming in, welcome again to our Health and the Economy Summit. There is a survey in your Eventia platform. Please feel free to check that out and join us for our upcoming sessions on essential workers, on benefit design. And tomorrow um, you're in for a real treat uh, as we speak to some local leaders about uh, how businesses and local governments have pivoted in this pandemic. Thanks again, signing off. I am Sarah Dash and we'll see you soon.